talking, I would like to just say this is the biggest Zoom I have ever been on in my life. We looks like we're going to break 500 any minute now. So thank you all for joining us. Given all that's going on in our country right now, it gives us much hope that, like I said, it's 500 and running up by the second here, uh, that 500 plus of us are investing our time tonight in planning for a democratic, and that's both small and big D, future. I'm Susan Blunt, one of the directors of Neighbors on Call. You'll hear from my co-director, uh, Becca Zirkin, in a few minutes. But first, many thanks to Amy Cox and Brianna Bro, co-founders and directors of Flip and C, and to Dr. Amy Steele, who you'll hear a lot from in a little bit, Diane Robertson, Marilyn Carter, and Jonah Garson for their collaboration with us on this event. We couldn't have done it without them. And thanks to the many other folks who've helped us pull together this session. Takes a lot. Takes a village to do a big Zoom, I tell you. Because of this large audience now that we have tonight, everyone is muted, and except me, obviously, and your videos are turned off. We're really sorry that we can't see you all, all your faces. The way we're going to do questions tonight is at the end, we'll address as many as we can. Please submit your questions to, there's one person on here who's changed her name to questions here. It's, it's really uh, Tracy Rains, but uh, you submit your questions uh, to her in the chat. Uh, we're all here because we believe in the ideals of the Democratic Party, in our Democratic elected officials, and in progressive policy that will make a difference in the lives of North Carolinians. We think it's safe to say that everyone here has invested sweat equity into electing Democrats last year in some way or other. And we're honored to be joined tonight by many distinguished guests. To get a sense of who all is here, we're gonna do something we haven't done before, at least for Neighbors on Call. We're gonna start with a quick poll. It should pop up about now. Please go ahead and answer just two questions. Go ahead and answer those and we'll share the results in a minute. I'm Becca Zirkin. I am the other co-director of Neighbors on Call. And tonight is the first event in a series to explore how we can build a grassroots strategy to elect Democrats in North Carolina, starting with a close look at how Wisconsin built a permanent every year, all year grassroots organizing program. We're eager to hear more about how they did it and if it worked. And spoiler alert, our next event will focus on Georgia. We're so grateful to Ben Wickler, the chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, and Nellie Sires, the executive director, for being so generous with their time and wisdom tonight, and to our moderator, Dr. Amy Steele, who will help us digest a lot of information in the next hour. Every state is different demographically, geographically, historically, and surely there is not a one size fits all strategy. But what we hear tonight can help inspire us to think about what's possible. Let's take a look at our poll results first. Those should pop up. Um, wow, 16% of you from outside North Carolina, that's fantastic. And lots of volunteers, and many different roles. We are going to put those in the chat. So don't worry if you wanted more time to absorb those numbers, they're gonna show up in the chat in a moment. Thank you for doing that. Uh, now, North Carolina's brand new state Senator from Wake County, Sydney Batch will introduce our speakers. For over a decade, Senator Batch has served as a family law attorney child welfare advocate and social worker. In 2018, she was elected to the state house where she sponsored and co-sponsored 48 bills for comprehensive legislation for everyday North Carolinians. We know she'll keep up the good fight in the Senate. We're so grateful for all that you do. Senator Batch, welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm so very thankful for all of what you guys are doing today to just be on this call. It's already 730. The weather was actually really nice today, but you guys are still committed even after the election um, to make sure that you are here to advocate. 
um, for everything that we need to do moving forward. Um, just briefly, I think that, and what you'll see in Dr. Steele's you know, approach, and anyone who knows her knows how absolutely energetic and amazing she is. But one of the things that I think is really clear about what happened in 2020 is that she and myself ran for re-election, put our heart, sweat, blood, tears into it, had so many of you on this call help us, and we fell short. So we're at a point where we need to really look at, a de at the Democratic Party in North Carolina and try and figure out how we move forward so that we don't continue to repeat the same mistakes, right? We don't want to be here in 2022 and 2024. And so we really need to focus on how we move forward so that we can get the great legislation done that we need to um, in moving forward over the next generations. We're in a year of you know, redistricting, so we know what that's going to probably look like, another decade of litigation in North Carolina. Um, but we're going to still, we're not going to let the litiga litigation stop us um, and what the maps will look like. We'll do our best when we're in the, in the General Assembly to fight for fair maps. But until that time, we have to still prepare because we can't control it because we aren't in control in the General Assembly as of right now. So without further ado, let me move forward and introduce our speakers for tonight. I'm pleased to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Amy Steele, who will be moderating tonight's event. Um, many of you know that she ran in 2020 as a candidate for the North Carolina House in District 82 and in Cabarrus County. And she's been endorsed by Emily's List, Down Home North Carolina, Equality NC, and many more organizations. I had the great privilege of meeting Amy in 2018 when we both ran for the North Carolina House. I discovered then that our, our um, trajectory, like her, she went to high school with my husband, uh, we became fast friends, and we've continued to build on that friendship over the past um, you know, two years now. She went on to run again in 2020, um, before, but before running for office, many of you know that Amy was a dynamic elementary school principal in Concord, North Carolina. And if you spend more than two minutes speaking to her, you know that she's passionate about ensuring that every single child in North Carolina and across this country receives an amazing education, knowing it's the building block and foundation of which people can make sure that they, are, they can move themselves from poverty and have a wonderful and fulfilling and prosperous life. She earned her PhD in curriculum and instruction from UNC Charlotte, and she is a mother of five and has been married to uh, her husband, Michael, for the past 21 years. Her family, and our, her family and faith are core to her life, and they currently live in um, Concord, and they attend New Life Baptist Church, and her husband is the pastor there. The next, uh, who we'll hear from, of course, um, on the panel today is Ben Wickler, and he's the chair of the Wisconsin Democratic Party. As MoveOn.org's Washington, D.C. director, Ben worked closely with the Obama White House, served as a surrogate for Bernie Sanders, and helped raise millions of dollars for grassroots or from grassroots organizations to elect and help elect um, Hillary Clinton. He's played a leadership role in some of the most critical political fights of recent years, and he aims to supercharge grassroots energy in every part of Wisconsin to fight for a progressive agenda and secure Democratic victor victories up and down the ballot for years to come. He was raised in Madison, where he now lives with his, with his wife, Beth, and their three children. And the other um, panelist that we have tonight is Nellie Sires, and she's the executive director of the Wisconsin Democratic Party. She's a powerhouse organizer campaigner and leader. She has served in a variety of campaign roles at the DCCC, I said probably too many C's in that one, um, on the statewide campaigns and on President Obama's 2012 re-election. Um, at the Management Center, she's trained thousands of progressive leaders, including the Democratic Party um, of Wisconsin staff, on topics like how to manage and win campaigns, diversity, equity, inclusion, and building high-performance teams. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Steele for this engaging evening of which we will talk about next steps and what Wisconsin has done to build the model that they have in their Democratic Party to be so successful. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Batch, my girl. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And welcome to everyone. I'm super excited to be here, so let's jump in. All right, Ben. Can you say something? Ben, say hello. Hello, and thank there you. you are. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Nellie, can you say hello? Nellie. Hello. Thank you hey. for having me. <laughs> okay, now I can see you on my screen. Let's jump in. All right, Ben, it's going to come at you fast and furiously. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, Ben, for you, what was the problem for Democrats in Wisconsin in 2016? What did you notice as you came on board? So, um, I will confess, I was elected chair 
in 2019. And I ran for chair in part because the person before me had done an extraordinary thing. She had been, her name is Martha Lanning. She was the chair in 2016, which was a wrenching and painful year in Wisconsin. Wisconsin on election day in 2016, Hillary Clinton was six and a half points up in the public polls. It was treated as a safe state. Uh, the first television ad for the Clinton campaign went up on October 28th. The, the nominee famously never visited the state during the general election. It was supposed to be a sure thing. And then Democrats lost by seven tenths of one percentage point. It was crushing. I was knocking doors in Wisconsin in, in election day and, and that week in 2016. And I was convinced that I must have gotten the worst packets because it seemed like every other door I went to had an undecided voter and I was supposed to be getting out the vote for the hardcore Democrats. Turned out it wasn't just a problem that I was experiencing. And um, my, my predecessor chair did a deep dive, a sort of post-mortem of what happened, talked to people all over the state, listened, and zeroed in on the fact that for a long time, campaigns would be built in the final months of an election and then totally shut down afterwards. And, and when those campaigns were built, they would uh, sort of come up from scratch, often with folks who weren't familiar with the, with the state, with the particular communities that they were in, who wouldn't have a relationship with volunteers. And so it was a boom bust cycle. And during the boom times, it wasn't rooted in relationships in the community. So she went on the lookout for a model that could overcome some of these challenges and found the Obama neighborhood team organizing model where you hire organizers not to knock on doors or even call volunteers and ask them to knock on doors, but you hire organizers to recruit team and train team captains, neighbor to neighbor team captains who could build their own neighborhood teams that then mobilize volunteers to talk to voters. And in the spring of 2017, she raised some money and hired an organizing team and they started building neighborhood teams that built and built and built all the way through the fall of 2018 where despite a huge voter suppression effort by the GOP, Democrats swept every statewide office for the first time in 19, since 1982, they won a clean sweep. And uh, when I, uh, shortly after that, she and I talked, I decided to run for chair with the goal of continuing that model for the next two years and beyond and supercharging it, of, of um, taking a, a year round organizing structure and making it bigger and deeper and uh, bringing technology into the fold and uh, making sure we, were we had people talking to voters in their own communities in every corner and every community of the state. Uh, folks who uh, looked like them, folks who had similar lived experience, people who understood, uh, you know, in this place, there's a problem with the water because of lead pipes. And in this place, there's a problem with the water uh, because of uh, poorly built wells. And there's a lot of water problems in Wisconsin and whatever the other local issues are. So this was a, um, a model for us that had, had worked powerfully in the Obama years, but it had never been done in Wisconsin and really rare across the country to have this model year round, year over year through the state party so that it could work on every election. And our goal was to use every election as training for the next one. So uh, in the spring of 2020, we had our hundreds of neighborhood teams focused on a spring Supreme Court race, both because it was important in itself and because it could be a dress rehearsal for the fall. And that wound up being the critical ingredient at the end mm -hmm. because we had this infrastructure that we've been building and building. When COVID hit, we could actually take transition an infrastructure that already existed to actually try out organizing a real election in the middle of the pandemic. We learned how to organize virtually and then we could just hit the gas and keep on growing for the fall. So that is the, that's the problem we ran into and doing it year round with neighborhood teams was the, was the solution that we um, went to town with. Right. So thank you for sharing that. And what I hear you saying is, of course, you recognize the issue, but it came from your previous chair who really did a deep dive into the data. And then once uh, she emerged, she really realized that the OFA model was very effective and had been effective and then utilized that to kind of propel you into the next preparation for the next cycle. Um, and then, of course, handed that right on to you and you continued the work and built it even even better. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to get into a little bit of the demographics of Wisconsin because, you know, we're in North Carolina. We've got about 76 or more people from out of the state. Uh, Nellie, if you would, why don't you jump into a little bit about the Wisconsin demographics? Talk to us about, you know, who you were reaching out to, who you have in your state, rural versus urban, people of color versus non-people of color, et cetera. 
Yeah. Um, so Wisconsin um, is significantly whiter uh, than North Carolina. It's about 87% um, white folks. Uh, we've got about six or seven percent uh, black Af African American population. Um, we do have um, a little over a percent of indigenous folks, um, and then we have uh, about a three percent population um, of an AAPI population. A large portion of that being um, among population in in particular. Um, so there is uh, great racial and ethnic diversity um, in Wisconsin, whether or not that is uh, something that people normally think about um, is, is, is something different, right? Uh, we do primarily have um, our, our BIPOC population is primarily focused um, in the cities, but that is not an exclusive, um, that is not an exclusive fact across the state. Um, there are absolutely uh, Black and Latinx farmers in Wisconsin. Um, um, so one of the challenges around organizing that we really wanted to rise to um, was ensuring that our outreach to communities of color wasn't exclusively focused uh, on urban areas. And so really making sure that we were meshing our county party operation with our neighborhood team operation was really essential to that effort. Um, but our constituency organizing was still absolutely key and, and absolutely vital. Um, um, and I think we, we have a really good um, stat, and Ben can help me out with the exact specifics on this, um, but the number of attempts and pieces of outreach that we did um, to Black Wisconsinites in 2020 in particular um, actually dwarfed the total number of attempts um, to voters that we really knew about in 2018 in those elections all together. Um, so we really did focus on outreach to communities of color um, this cycle. Um, I will be really candid, though, and say that, you know, just across the country, uh, Wisconsin was no exception. We did seemingly not actually maintain the growth um, in our uh, voters of color that we wanted to, um, specifically in the, the Milwaukee area, um, that we really would have hoped. Um, and so that's a really big area of focus for us in the, in the 22 cycle. Okay, great. And so it sounds like the party really worked in collaboration with, uh, you know, organizing and maintaining the structure of the organization year round. Um, and then you mentioned the demographics that is starkly different from North Carolina. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think that's relevant for those listening. So Ben, tell us, you know, from an organizational perspective, how is your party structured just in general? What are kind of some big highlights? And then how does organizing fit into that just structure in general? Sure. So uh, during the kind of heat of the campaign in the final months, the, the largest share by far of our staff is organizing. And one of the things I wanna um, underscore is that we kind of made a bet in the 2016 cycle, which is that we decided to build a presidential scale campaign before we knew who the nominee would be and pitch the nominee on working with that infrastructure as opposed to sweeping it off the table and starting over. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the thumbs up. It took a deep breath to, to, to do, I'll tell you. In 2016, the party had had, I think, four organizers on staff before um, the summer, and all of them were let go, and the organizing program was started from zero in August of 2016. Um, this time, by the time the, the Biden campaign landed in Wisconsin, we had more than, I think it was about 100, Nellie, is this right, 125 organizers on staff? Um, 137 when they actually landed. Thank you, 137 organizers. and. The Biden campaign made this, uh, it also kind of took a leap of faith and it fully integrated with the infrastructure that, we'd been, that we had built. Um, this didn't happen by accident. We were in touch with all the presidential primary campaigns um, starting in 2019 and continuously through the end of the primary, um, briefing them, introducing them to different people. Um, Nellie, uh, who's a, a veteran organizer at, at national and state and local levels, um, had been roommates with the Biden campaigns uh, you don't mind me disclosing it, uh, organizing director. So it was telling him all about the neighborhood team structure that we had. Uh, but it meant that um, none of that work, all that knowledge, all those relationships were brought directly to the presidential. And one thing I'm grateful for about the Biden campaign's approach, um, well, everything we're hearing is that they're committed to doing that on a continuing basis, 
uh, across the country. If you build it, they will come and they will work with you as opposed to um, kind of parachuting in a presidential operation right at the end. Right. So I think our listeners will love how you um, built the model with the expectation and the hope that whomever the nominee was, they were going to come in and just kind of mesh into it. Um, and you're right. Field of Dreams is absolutely essential in this moment. And I know you love movies too. So yes, if you build it, they will come. And apparently they came and it worked and they integrated directly with your operation. So thank you for that. Nelly, talk to us about this whole year round operation. When you're talking about hiring leaders, you know, who do you organize? How do you get your organizers? And what do you do year round? Yeah. Um, so it really is, I really, I love how you named um, hiring and kind of the leadership pieces, because that is absolutely my, my jam and something that was essential to our operation. Um, so we really did emphasize hiring local as much as we possibly could. Um, I, like Ben, inherited a, a really fantastic um, program that was up and running thanks to um, Martha Lanning. And we took it and we, we iterated on it. Um, one of the first things I did when I came in as executive director um, was overhauling the hiring process to make it as accessible as possible, um, really removing barriers of entry. Um, I will say, and I feel comfortable saying this as an, as an OFA alum, um, it, there are elements of the team model and of organizing um, that can really be difficult uh, if you don't have the time uh, and the money essentially to work for free, to volunteer for free. Um, I know I got my start because I was able to volunteer for free as a fellow on the Obama campaign. We really wanted to make sure that people could get their foot in the door, but didn't have to be socioeconomically privileged in order to do so. Um, so one of the first things we did as part of kind of overhauling our hiring and our pipeline um, was ensure that we were actually going to pay uh, interns in the organizing program. And um, we really emphasized uh, doing a lot of recruitment and outreach, um, not only to campuses and universities, but also to tech and vocational schools, making sure that we were doing outreach on different community boards, doing specific outreach um, in, uh, in like com specific communities of color in terms of uh, things like building partnerships with HBCUs to make sure that we were doing really concrete outreach and uh, that we're actually partnering with local community leaders to help us get the word out about our jobs. And then as we were running this actual structure and this process, we made sure that we weren't evaluating people simply based on their resume. Uh, that one of the first things that you do when you get and you apply for a job with us is you get a screening, a phone screen interview, where you just have to talk to somebody and actually pitch them on who you are and why you want the job, because that is a really a 101 basic simulation for what all organizers have to do. So as opposed to looking at a pile of resumes and eliminating people based on experience or fancy internships that they had, we're actually evaluating at that first step, the skills that they're bringing to the table. And that was really, really essential. So actually training managers to be able to hire that way and hire differently help us set up how we could actually run a program that was significantly more local and uh, significantly more reflective of the diversity of Wisconsin. Right. I think it's absolutely imperative to remove barriers to hiring. So I appreciate your forethought in that process. Um, and so on that note, how did you recruit volunteers or staff in rural areas? Um, were your organizers from these areas? Did you solely focus in that in that you know, capacity or in that area, those areas? Yeah. Um, so we really did utilize our partnerships with county parties quite a bit to do recruitment there. Um, we also had the same type of approach, right? Partnering with different community um, leaders. So we have great friends uh, on the soft side uh, on C3s and C4s, and there's different listservs in the state um, and really utilizing those networks to get the word out um, about our jobs and what those things look like. I will be very candid and say that the um, 
the pandemic became a, a barrier to how we were able to do some of that recruitment, because a lot of that was like literally having people going and posting on physical community boards. And that was a lot of the work that we were doing up until kind of those March months. After that, the team really had to pivot into finding those online and those digital spaces. So things like Facebook groups that were local um, became a really good resource for that type of recruitment, as well as some of those like local long standing democratic groups. So there was like old school OFA groups that had been around since since 2008. Um, and there were places that were um, local meetup spaces. Uh, I know, what was it? There was a, a farm and fleet board uh, that became a really regular posting place uh, in a couple of our different counties um, that uh, one of our regional field directors found on Facebook that was just absolutely essential for us in that role of recruitment. And the OFA campaign definitely used meetup as well, right? Yeah. Significantly. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. So Ben, and then Nelly, of course. How much does it cost to run this effort and how do you prioritize spending? You know, fundraising is essential. So obviously you're raising money and I love the unique ways you all have chosen to raise funds uh, this last cycle. I won't bore the audience with all of those ways I've been researching, but tell us how much does this whole thing cost? <laughs> oh, Ben, you're muted. Unmute yourself. We'd love to hear you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, uh, it does take some money to be able to do this. And before I say a number, I want to emphasize um, Wisconsin's one of a handful of states that have a paid chair position. So this is my full-time job. Um, really? Yes, and that makes a big difference because I essentially can use a bunch of, you know, because I don't have to have another job or have an independent source of wealth. Um, I can get up in the morning and do this all day and I can spend a lot of the day raising money. And that money can then go to pay other people on the staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nelly, who uh, has a, a background actually training leaders of organizations, is able to um, not spend her time raising money. She's able to focus on professionally managing and structuring and overseeing the operation. And that makes a huge difference. In a lot of places, the executive directors have to spend their time raising money, and there's very little management capacity of the organization. Um, the, so I would say having a professional finance staff, a paid chair, and then having, we have a statewide organizing director, um, mm. a, um, we have two deputy, right now I think two deputy directors. Um, we've scaled the different time, three deputy directors right now, thank you. Two and I came in, I had more before, I've shrunk down. Um, you should, uh, I mean, I'd recommend raising a million dollars a year to have at the core of an organizing staff um, that can build neighborhood teams across the state. The great thing uh, is that once you have a, you know, a, a statewide organizing directory, deputy directors, regional organizing directors, you can then scale up when it comes time for an election, hiring field organizers who work in a more local basis. Um, and then when you scale back down after the election, you continue the relationships with those neighborhood teams. So we are still talking to these neighborhood teams that we, we built. We wound up having you know, hundreds of organizers by election day in 2020, but the teams are all still there. So now when we're down to a couple dozen people on our organizing team, they're all still in touch with these hundreds of teams across the state. Um, they'll be working on a, a much lower profile state head of public schools election this spring, and they'll continue organizing on issues um, like the statewide budget fight, things like that between elections so that we build the team capacity and the muscles are all still there when we get into the fall of 2022. So uh, you know, pay a chair to be able to raise the money, to be able to hire the organizers um, and I think ours started with a kind of mid six figures investment, mm. about uh, $300,000 in 2017, I think went into it. Um, obviously the more you put in, the more you, you get out of it, but you need, to, you need to be able to launch with a meaningful number of people to actually work with um, new neighborhood team captains and get those off the ground. So you definitely struck a nerve with the paid chair. So thank you for being transparent about that. Um, also, would you give us just a couple of numbers? Um, roughly how many organizers did you have from the state level, regional organizers? And then how many you know, neighborhood teams would you estimate you end it with in 2020? Nellie, I want to throw to you because you, uh, Nellie had daily check-ins with our statewide organizing director and could probably tell you month by month what those numbers look like. Yeah. Uh, I haven't done month by month in a minute off the top of my head, but um, so we actually um, ended um, with 17 field regionals, um, so across the state, um, but that in, that encapsulated uh, 
13 different regions and then four deputy regionals um, to support some of the more what we refer to as mega regions. When we had denser populated areas, we wanted to make sure that when there was you know, 12 organizers answering to a single regional field director, that's a really tough ratio. So we wanted to make sure the management ratio was enough where they had the support that they actually um, actively needed on the ground. Um, and then all told, um, we ended the cycle um, with about 209 organizers that were full-time organizers and then we had an additional um, 67 um, organizing interns that were paid interns that worked either part-time or full-time. Um, so we had a massive, massive team um, by the time we were done. The other thing that I, I just wanna name that as Ben is talking about like kind of ramping up and ramping down, um, one thing that I think sometimes folks really struggle with um, is they think that a, an organizer and an entry-level organizer um, because they may be able to save some, some money on the cost there um, is the way to go. Um, and I think that that can be a great first step, but I really do wanna emphasize that when you wanna do long-term scaling of a program, you've gotta have those regional level folks and those organizing director level folks, because at a certain level, when you've got teams functioning year over year, that job is half political director, half traditional organizing director. Mm -hmm. Those folks are not just making those phone calls themselves. They really are train the trainer folks. They really are solving political problems day in and day out. And you need folks with a little bit more experience to actually maintain that flow over time. Got it. So more from a leadership perspective rather than working in the field themselves perspective. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right, well, let's move on. We, um, I wanna move into kind of community partnerships. So how, and this question can start with Nelly, go to Ben, you know, however you all wanna handle it. How does the party collaborate with other groups? So, you know, we have C3, C4s, you have grassroots organizations who are, you know, not necessarily paperwork organized, um, but they're still organized. And then you have the party structure. So how did you all like collaborate with other groups? Yeah. Um, so this was a project that um, I will say Ben was on board and, and chair for, for uh, about four or five months before I was hired on. Um, and I know that he really threw himself into it. So I do want to let him speak on this, but we're really um, lucky in Wisconsin. We have a structure um, where we have a research consortium. Um, called Badger Street State Research that allows us um, to actually get um, information and research and do polling in a legally compliant way and actually share those things um, across the walls because we're not actually doing collaborative input on what those pieces look like. We all do that separately and then it kind of goes into a black box. Um, so that partnership combined um, with also a, uh, a comms hub in state that really helps put out top line messaging, um, again, in a legally compliant way to really assemble kind of the C3 and C4 partners. Then what's, what we're able to do is as the party, we're able to regularly come together and brief them, just say in a one way fashion, this is what we're doing. This is our public facing work. They then can inform us about their public facing work. And then we have a much better sense of what it actually looks like folks are doing. The other key piece of structure, I do want to give credit where credit is due with the, the, the ASDC, the Association of State Democratic Chairs and the DNC, they have set up the Democratic Data Exchange. Um, and that is actually, that is another element that enables C4 groups to input data, campaign side folks to input data. And because the data is then anonymized, we're then able to get data back out. We don't know who actually made that phone call. We don't actually know what group made that knock, but we can then actually get out the IDs that the other side has done. So there's also some really good national level infrastructure that was absolutely key. Um, all of this really fell under um, kind of the, the bigger picture collaboration of the donor table in the state of Wisconsin. And I know that Ben can speak to the details and specifics on that. Um, thanks, Nelly. I will just chime in. There's been a real intentional effort by independent side groups and by the party to work as part of one overall fabric. And that work includes lots of individual regular check-ins that group leaders and party folks and other folks have. And uh, weekly meetings where there's, a, there's essentially three different sets of meetings that happen. One where nonprofits that you know aren't allowed to talk to us, they're nonpartisan, um, but they all talk. 
the groups doing issue advocacy and the party are allowed to talk about everything. So we all get together and talk. And then groups doing independent expenditure political work, those folks talk. Uh, and then, you know, and then we have the, the sort of briefings like Nelly was describing. Um, there are a number of states. Minnesota has a model that we've learned a ton from. Michigan has a model we've learned a ton from. Colorado, um, they all use pretty similar structures where you have a kind of C3 nonprofit organization table. You have a, a C4 table. You have a party working um, in, in complementary tracks. And because everyone has a sense of what everyone else is doing, and I'll say one last piece of that, after every election, we all get together and have a walls down debrief where we all explain to each other what we just did things we couldn't talk about during the election. And knowing what we've done in the past is very, very helpful for understanding what everybody's core strengths and competencies are so that the work that we do is complementary and additive rather than being duplicative or trying to fight over you know, the, same, the same turf, so to speak, or, or, or piece of the pie. Um, that all means that we're sort of working from an overall theory about how we win elections and how we create change in our communities. And the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. And we try to encourage our organizing staff, our political staff, our county parties to similarly view themselves as part of a broader fabric of a, of a movement of an ecosystem, um, as opposed to being in a uh, kind of zero sum situation where we're fighting for the same volunteer or the same dollar. Uh, right. We all, we need all of us to be able to succeed. That's right. And collaboration is key when you're trying to win in high stakes elections. So a uh, little bit off script, how did candidates factor into the information that you were sharing? Because you had you know, a ton of candidates whom obviously you flipped their seats. How did they factor into receiving some of this information? Um, I'll start with one bit and Nelly can say some more. Um, one thing that having a kind of shared research organization is really helpful with is that um, you know, an independent group or a camp candidate campaign or the party could commission a poll that then would be, could be legally uh, shared with everybody, at, you know, looking at the situation. So everyone had a shared base of data um, that was really helpful. Now, Wisconsin, like many other states, turned out a lot of the polling wasn't accurate. And that was, uh, you know, a genuine challenge. You think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will say that we sort of built the, we built the party apparatus um, and our strategy around how do we prevent a worst case scenario? Our legislative program uh, was called Save the Veto, sort of like the break the majority was in North Carolina you know, a while ago. Um, even though a lot of folks were looking at polling and saying maybe we can get a majority in, in the state legislature, we were focused on stopping Republican supermajorities. And we came very close to losing that fight, but we won it. Um, I think thanks to playing it very safe and really throwing ourselves into the most uh, critical seats to hold. Um, but having, uh, you know, for, for, for candidates themselves, um, they worked with the Legislative Caucus and also with the state party. We had a program called Save the Veto at the state party that we staffed up, um, worked in partnership with our governor and with the Legislative Caucuses to provide direct support to state legislative candidates. Um, and then with our coordinated campaign, we were able to invest to make sure that we had state legislative candidates on the scripts for calls, on the door hangers, um, that, that they weren't sort of like left off because they were the lowest profile piece of the equation. And, it, and, and that uh, made a real difference. Nelly, would you, what would you add to that? Yeah, I would add that um, part of that, right, was as part of that coordinated campaign, we really did seek to keep up those relationships because fundamentally you are asking people to trust you a little bit and give over a little bit of the, the power and the control in their race, which can be a really hard thing for candidates and campaign managers to do. So we had to build that trust over time. And it was really important to establish that coordinated campaign well before we had a top of the ticket race. Um, so that was really the, 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 the germ, like the thing that started um, with us actually having a department that owned all of that work. And we call it our elections department. Um, Right, so they really own those different pieces of that relationship. Um, part of those conversations then resulted in let's actually also stand up a save the veto department and see what that looks like. And to Ben's point, we then offered campaign managers that we professionally onboarded and kind of did a group orientation, group staffing, and everyone was sharing the same best practices and information while also supporting those candidates. So we were able to kind of build that trust through the level of service that we were able to offer, um, but also it took time, it took time and energy and just old fashioned relationship building. 
Wow, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, we've been very fortunate here in North Carolina, but I was just curious about that component. Um, so what technology, we're gonna move into technology because clearly it took over our lives in 2020. So what technology infrastructure existed in Wisconsin? And this goes to maybe Nellie first, and how did you acquire any new technology infrastructure based on your needs? Yeah, um, so I will say that we really did the big um, digital pivot uh, right as um, the news about the pandemic was becoming really real. And one of the first things that we did um, was acquire Zoom licenses, not only for every single member of our staff, um, but also for all of our county parties, because we wanted to ensure that they could continue to have regular meetings and conduct business as safely as possible as the COVID case numbers were actively on the rise. Um, we also had had a long-term contract um, of a texting platform, um, and that was something that our organizing team um, ran, as well as our political team had access to to also distribute out to certain county parties when they had particular issues and needs for those pieces. Um, I think the other big piece um, on the technology front, and I will just say this again in the element of like, eliminating barriers of opportunity and what it takes to work um, in politics is we did ensure that every single staffer at DPW had a laptop or a Chromebook that was purchased for them. And that was not something that you had to buy on your own. Um, and that was really, really essential. In addition to making sure that our staff were provided with uh, cell phone stipends, um, because all of that stuff costs money. And when you don't, when you're not able to provide that, that does become um, a barrier of entry. We did also build uh, long-term infrastructure and we really did try to anticipate the needs of what the eventual presidential nominee would be doing in terms of relational organizing app, what texting platform, those different pieces. Um, I will say we made some bets that turned out to be right. We made some bets that turned out to not be right. So we were we had some contracts that were a little duplicative by the end, um, but those were some, some major investment pieces. Um, ben, I know I, I've definitely forgotten something in all of that. <laughs> Um, I will, I want to speak specifically to relational organizing, which is a very high impact way of organizing where you give people tools that allow them to basically reach out to people that they know that are in their contacts list and record the results of those conversations. Those have some of the predictably highest impact of any form of voter outreach is when it's someone you know who's calling or texting you. Um, so we invested in a relational organizing tool in the spring election. We found some really strong success with it. The Biden campaign used a different one, um, but we leaned into making that a part of the volunteer experience. And that's something I absolutely want us to scale up. I think one thing we learned is that when you call someone three times, it can have an effect. It's the fourth through 16th call. If they're not picking up the phone already, it often doesn't have as much effect. And so once we've reached out to a voter, you know, multiple times through phones and texts, really thinking about how to reach them through relational channels or direct messages on social media, things like that become an added benefit. And um, those relationship, relational tools are something that you can build you know, year in and year out. Um, we also, a huge thing that shifted for us because of COVID was guessing, asking people to request absentee ballots. And what we found ultimately, because we had this program of first we ask people to request them, then we do everything we can to help them return those ballots, 98% of our voters who requested absentee ballots wound up voting. And so you can request an absentee ballot for the whole year at any time during the year. And that means that doing direct voter contact the whole year can have a gigantic effect. And that's where you know testing out different things, cycling through different methods of voter contact, um, trying out apps and if they work, scale them up. And if they don't, don't. Um, that kind of approach of experimenting year round as opposed to just making a bet in the last few months, I think was critical to right. our approach and something we're carrying forward. Wow, awesome. And, uh, you know, after the third time of contacting someone, you know, they, they get agitated. So <laughs> Send, sending in a cousin or a friend is a wise idea. All right, so we're gonna turn over to some questions from our audience. So several people have asked this. So hiring all these people year round, it's super expensive. Where does the money come from? And you know, what about strings attached to the money? Um, and I do want you to talk about one of your fundraising ideas that raised four and a half million dollars in one day. So um, I will, I'll start with that one. Okay. Uh, we, our best ever fundraising event, I probably never to be matched, although we will try, was 
um, a live script read by the original cast of The Princess Bride um, in a, a, a basically a Zoom. We used some special technology to spice it up a little bit um, with some special guests like Whoopi Goldberg and Josh Gad, who was the voice of Olaf in um, uh, in Frozen and Frozen. Frozen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the Princess Bride cast and some special friends, um, we organized that um, because we'd had a, another experience that was nowhere at the same scale, but also very successful with someone from Wisconsin, Bradley Whitford, the actor. Um, West Wing. West Wing, exactly. Um, and uh, also more recently, Get Out and A Handmaid's Tale. Uh, so he had always come back to Wisconsin to do fundraising events. And that wasn't possible because of COVID. So we worked with him on the idea of getting the, some of the West Wing cast members, and there's a, a podcast called the West Wing Weekly, the host of that, to do a kind of Zoom fundraiser for us. And we said to people, you can chip in any amount and you can watch this. And we wound up having thousands of people that watched it and they, it raised $160,000, which was our most successful event since the pandemic started. So that started us brainstorming. Who do we know in entertainment universe or people who, someone who knows someone who knows someone. And uh, through a chain like that, someone called the, uh, the star of the man in black from the Princess Bride and he was fired up and wanted to help. And he called all the other cast members and put that together. Now, those events, which we now call grassroots fundraisers, and there's probably some better way to describe them. Uh, again, you can give $1, you can give $10,000, you can give anything in between, but they're really fun. And you can do them with musicians, you can do them with actors from TV shows or plays. You know, there's a Hamilton uh, original yeah. cast reunion that Biden, uh, the Biden campaign did. Um, we wound up doing a bunch of those and they transformed our fundraising they also brought that ultimately several hundred thousand new people in to the party who became small donors who gave multiple times. And so that has transformed our budget for the off year because these are relationships with people who we can email. Some of them are giving monthly. Um, those have absolutely no strings attached, um, but they come from this kind of enthusiasm. And during the events, we would ask people to donate again and also ask them to sign up as volunteers. So we got thousands of volunteers from those events. Now, the key thing is you, you've got to organize the event and you need to really do everything you can to promote it and let people know about it. And that came from working with our talent, um, also working with everyone we could direct message on Twitter and asking them to amplify it um, from pitching the, the media about events. And that, that event in particular got a ton of coverage because Ted Cruz tweeted that he was angry about it, which helped it blow through the roof. Media were very interested. He's a Princess Bride fan, although the Princess Bride cast does not agree with his politics in the slightest. Um, so that was a big piece. Um, we also, uh, you know, I spent time every day calling donors and, you know, sometimes I'd be asking for $500 and sometimes we'd be asking for uh, gigantic amounts of money and nobody would be nose to that. Um, but our presentation was using the data from the year round organizing program, election after election, demonstrating that the number of interactions with voters we could have kept going up as we built more teams so the efficiency of the dollars we could spend went up over time. And uh, also making the case that what happened in Wisconsin was gonna be critical to the country. North Carolina has the same, you have the same uh, claim to fame that it's a pivotal state for presidential races with the balance of power in the Senate, the state that can go either way. Um, and the fact that I could devote so much time to making those calls, laying out that case and having something where a dollar could go a long way made a big difference with donors. Most of our, uh, we, we fundraise within the state. We have lots of Zoom events and we, I called people all over the country uh, to, you know, to, to make the case and all those pieces together allowed us to invest in this big way. And when you fundraise like that during a presidential year, you're able to set aside some funds for the off years. Is that what I'm hearing? And so that takes care of the budget for the organizers and all the other things you pay for. So we right. wound up having this wild thing at the end of the election uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against us in Wisconsin, said that, mm -hmm. that absentee ballots that came in after, after the uh, election day should be thrown out, even though in the spring election, they could arrive six days after the election. Um, we used that to call all of our donors, get everyone together and say, we need to go just do everything we can to make sure everyone in Wisconsin knows about this deadline. Um, we raised enough money to do that, and then a lot more. We raised, wound up raising $4 million in that final week of the election. And uh, that wave at the end is now you know, funding our organizing team right now. Uh, we're awesome. preparing the pitch to, 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 um, you know, to, to help people to invest for these next two years, but it did help us 
uh, to think, you know, to, to be able to have a cushion as we went into this year. I okay. do want to, I want to add two quick things if that's okay. Sure, please. Um, one of the pieces that also was essential um, was that obviously with state parties, we work really closely with other national partners. And when you've got a presidential, that's absolutely key. Um, and so one of the things that enabled us to do that and do it well and make sure um, that the state party was not left with a deficit was having a really professional operations staff. Um, that we had a budget director whose whole job it was to go through those things line by line and make sure that we knew exactly where every dime, every penny absolutely was in that process. The other thing that I will name about the grassroots fundraising and replicating that model, Ben absolutely is right, like finding the celebrities to do the Twitter shout outs and those pieces. The other piece that our digital director would tell you all is that the actual flow of the paid ads and actually finding um, the fan base for whatever that particular thing is and doing some serious targeting on those mm. fan bases was a huge way to convert watches to folks. It wasn't just folks that were interested in democratic politics. It wasn't folks that were just interested in Wisconsin Dems. It was folks that were specifically huge Princess Bride fans. And mm -hmm. we just targeted them and targeted them and targeted them in every digital method possible. And we kept replicating that in all of our events. Wow, love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, from Diane Robertson, what was your accountability metric for your organizers? How did you hold them accountable? Yeah, and Nelly. Yeah, yeah. We held them accountable um, in a number of different ways, um, but the primary way that we held them accountable um, was actually shifts scheduled and shifts completed. That was like their their go to gold standard. Um, that is a little bit of a move away from folks that just talk about dials. Um, and that was partially because when you've got folks sitting on an auto dialer talking about dials doesn't actually make sense. And as we know, different communities are going to respond to different tactics in different ways. So we had some organizers that had really great connections and it didn't make sense for them to sit there and make thousands of dials. It actually made sense for them to hit up their networks and they would double and triple the shifts that they got if we would have just been asking them to only do call time. So really focusing mm -hmm. on those shifts scheduled, shifts completed, that was essential. Okay, awesome. All right, another question from our audience. Do you plan to focus on persuading working class voters in Wisconsin who were once a bedrock of the Democratic Party in Midwestern states to come back to the party? If so, how do you do that? Yeah, um, I wanna- <laughs> Ben. Uh, <laughs> I wanna speak to that a bit. And I actually think um, part of this goes back to the hiring uh, aspects that Nellie spoke about. Because we use simulations as a key part of the hiring process, I will also say we use hiring committees for every position. So it's not just people hiring their friends. We build committees. The committees uh, have to, are, you know, by our structural rules, they have to be diverse and they have to include people from the communities in which people will be organizing. We tap, tap our county party leaders and our local neighborhood teams to have hiring committees that understand the turf. And that winds up actually filtering for people who have local knowledge and cultural competency in the communities in which they'll be working. And the best messenger is the messenger who can connect with you at a personal level. I think that's something that's very different from, you know, when there's a TV ad that's made at a campaign headquarters across the country that's beamed in. Um, having authentic conversations between members of the same community over a period of years can make a dramatic difference. That, that, that long-term regular high touch model is part of, for me, what persuasion really looks like. It's not the magic words in one conversation. And the other piece is that we talked this cycle to a much larger universe of voters than in previous mm -hmm. elections. We, when we, we just did the deep dive on our numbers, we had a total universe of 3 million voters in a state that had you know about uh, less than 4 million votes. Um, but the key thing is, when do you talk to those voters? We talk to people who might be Republican far from the election and find out whether there might be some glimmer of persuadability. So doing, doing year-round organizing allows you to talk to folks and see whether there might be an opportunity for them to, to vote in a new way or to start voting for the first time um, without the risk of doing a ton of mobilizing of the other side right at the end. Mm -hmm. And um, I you have vivid memories of you know, knocking doors in communities that were very Republican in 2019 and finding that those, you know, those few Democratic voters who had never gotten contacted by a Democratic campaign because they, the computer model would say they're almost certainly a Republican, mm -hmm. um, that builds the base that we can then turn out when it comes time to get out the vote at the end. 
Okay, awesome. Well, I know we're getting close to our time and we do have one more question. And if you guys want to stay on after 830, we welcome you to do that. So how did you, you use out of state volunteers this cycle? What are your thoughts about going forward, you know, rules and laws about collaborating with people outside um, of your state outside groups? And you, you talked about that from a national perspective, but uh, maybe you could focus just on out of state volunteers. Yeah, we had a whole um, distributed organizing program specifically for our out-of-state volunteers. We absolutely recruited them. Um, and uh, because we ended up using um, Mobilize, Mobilize makes it really, really easy for some outside groups to actually very easily post the events for Democratic Party of Wisconsin phone banks um, and actually post those and send that out to their own listserv. So that was really essential. Um, we use them quite a bit um, on the dialer. Um, and I will say that we, when we had folks that were out of state volunteers, those were folks that were kind of doing the, the statewide, more general um, phone banking. And then when we were really looking to do that detailed ballot chase work, we tended to switch to virtual phone banks and have that local person that actually could direct you of, hey, that ballot drop box, it's right across the street from the library and the fire station, and I know how to get there. So actually kind of switching what type of work we were asking out of state versus in state folks to do was really essential to the effectiveness of those folks. And the out of state volunteers kind of became their own teams and their own pods that would kind of, would come together um, and do big, massive statewide phone banks all together. Wonderful. Well, that concludes the official uh, list of questions. I've got some fun questions. How long can y'all stay? Let me ask that because we're going to stop. But how long can you stay? I can five do minutes. another. I can do another five only, unfortunately. You're the same. Ben can do five. All right. Am I clear to go five minutes from my tech people? Someone send me a message and say yes. Okay. All right. I'm clear to go five. Okay. <laughs> Tell us. Um, let, let's have a little fun. Um, what are you most excited about with the Biden Harris administration and the potential or the confirmed naming of Jamie Harrison as the uh, DNC chair? Oh. Okay, I'm so excited. Go. So I I am incredibly excited to see VP Harris preside over the Senate. I think that that is just going to be powerful and wonderful. And I'm also really excited um, to see the collaboration that I just know that she is going to have with future Attorney General Gorsuch and actually have that uh, prosecutorial relationship in terms of overhauling the Justice Department and really, really bringing uh, criminal justice reform to the forefront of that. Um, with uh, future chair, now chair, is it official? Um, Harrison? I, I think it is. <laughs> it's official. Um, I just could not be more thrilled to have somebody that just knows and loves state parties running the DNC. And I know that he is committed to long-term democratic infrastructure building. Uh, and I know that he's going to build on what Chairman Perez did. Um, and he just brings a particular perspective that is going to be absolutely, absolutely vital because he gets that long-term state party support is the thing that Democrats need to win. And it's not just about a presidential election. It's about all of the elections in between those local legislative races all the way up to the highest office in the land. Awesome. Thanks, Nelly. Ben? I, I mean, one thing I'm excited about is a lot less news alerts on my phone and <laughs> not having to wake up wondering what has gone horribly wrong in the highest office in the land and having a president and vice president who actually care about human beings as people so that the stuff that you don't see would make you happy as opposed to being terrified about what, might, what bugs might be hiding under the rock. That's a general sea change direction I'm excited about. And I want to echo uh, Nellie about uh, uh, Chairman uh, Harrison is, is it's it's so exciting to have someone who believes in building from the ground up in this way um, and has familiarity with state level infrastructure and how important it is coming coming into the fold. We, we've had a great partnership with Chairman Perez and um, Joe Biden and uh, his whole team and, and um, Vice President Harris, they believe in building with state infrastructure. And that they reflected that through the presidential campaign. We've heard that in our continuing conversations with their team since the election. And I think this pick for DNC chair reflects that. Uh, this will be a time when we grow and we flourish with, with all the infrastructure building from the ground up as opposed to letting it wither away just because we've gotten the top prize. And that's what we need to make sure 2022 is strong. 
That's right. And 2024 and beyond. Um, so last question, I just want to remind our audience to check the chat. Next steps, you're going to get an email from Neighbors on Call tomorrow. Make sure you complete our brief survey tomorrow. We want to have over 700 survey uh, completions, and we know we're all going to complete them. Audience, go ahead and nod your head with me. We're all going to complete our survey tomorrow because we're going to be good people who follow up with our emails. Great. Um, so last question, in one minute or less um, for Ben and one minute or less for Nelly, tell us some of the lessons learned from Wisconsin's experience over the last uh, election cycle. Lessons learned. I will just start with start early. What happens in November begins four years before that. Uh, start early and go continuously. Give yourself enough time to try things that fail so that you find the things that work. Uh, I am most proud of our many, many, many failures because they allowed us to find our way to the things that actually made a difference. And I hope we fail even more so we succeed even more in the future. Oh, Ben, that last one, I hope you fail. <laughs> ben, you had me at, you know, all the others, but I do understand. But Ben, wow, you, you got me there. <laughs> Go ahead, Nelly. <laughs> Uh, I think one of my biggest lessons learned uh, is you got to give trust to get trust. Um, and really building those relationships is vital and key. And it does take time to do those things. I think another lesson learned is that uh, one size fits all as a, as a model um, is never going to be the thing that works. And, and COVID taught us that early. Um, and so you've got to give your, your staff, your organizers, your managers, uh, your, your party leaders, the opportunity to test, to iterate, and to do things that work for them locally to inspire people to get engaged, because that's really what empowerment is all about. Well, I just want to say thank you to our uh, our mentors tonight. We'll call you mentors from Wisconsin, our North neighbors. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Flip and See Neighbors on Call. I'm going to turn it back over to our, our organizer um, and uh, co-chair of Neighbors on Call, Becca Zirkin. But thank you all so much, Ben and Nellie. Let's thank give you. them virtual hands. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. We cannot thank you enough. Oh my goodness. Thank you for all of that information for just being so forthcoming with us. And Dr. Steele, thank you for guiding us through all with all those excellent questions. You've all given us a lot to think about. Thank you so, so much. And ditto from me. Uh, sorry, interrupt, but I wanna say thank you from me too. It's just terrific, terrific. Thank you. And to everyone who's here tonight, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all of the elected officials who took time out of your busy schedule to come and be with us tonight. Uh, we wish we could recognize all of you. We are just really uh, pleased with everyone who's here. And we want to ask you all to please take the next three steps. Keep an eye out for the email tomorrow from Neighbors on Call. Please complete the survey. It'll be short. And we know, you know, saving things to do later, but then you forget and maybe it's just me, but if you can just send it right back, please, because we really want to hear your thoughts. And please stay tuned for our next event. And we want to give a special thanks to the tech crew behind the scenes, Shelby Clay, Ian Gardner and Diane Ong. Thank you so much. Great work. And thank you again, everyone. Good night. <laughs>